Now, Monitor brings you Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence Spivak. Ready for the unrehearsed conference are four of America's top news reporters ready to talk with British Foreign Secretary, the Earl of Hume. Here's tonight's moderator of Meet the Press, Lawrence Spivak. Before his appointment as British Foreign Secretary, Lord Hume was Secretary of State for Commonwealth Relations and a member of the British Cabinet for five years. He was leader of the House of Lords from 1957 to 1960. His selection as Foreign Secretary created great controversy in England because as a member of the House of Lords, he cannot be questioned by the House of Commons. And now Lord Hume will meet the press. We'll begin the question with Mr. Child. Lord Hume, you and the Prime Minister, Mr. McMillan, have had a meeting with Mr. Khrushchev, out of which very little seems to have come. And now another such meeting has been scheduled. I wanted to ask you whether you thought there was any purpose in talking to Chairman Khrushchev in his present intransigent mood. Well, uh, I think the first conversation that the Prime Minister had with um, Mr. Khrushchev was largely uh, taken up in each man trying to understand the other's point of view on questions like disarmament and that kind of thing. Now, there were certain points made by both uh, Mr. McMillan and Mr. Khrushchev, which each uh, wants to think over. And so it was agreed that they might meet again after the weekend. Well, what would you say could be an objective of these talks? What do you think can come out of them, possibly? in view especially of all the harsh things that have been said by Mr. Khrushchev and by Mr. McMillan and others? Well, if I may take uh, the one question of uh, disarmament. It has always seemed to us uh, that um, disarmament, uh, balanced disarmament, that is uh, nuclear and conventional armament taking place um, side by side and going hand in hand, must be as much in Russia's interest as it is in the interest of the West. And so we have tried to find out from Mr. Khrushchev what his objections, for instance, are to a scheme of inspection, which is really the heart of the matter. Carry out the agreed plans, well, then we're not going to get anywhere. So there was a kind of exploratory conversation. Well, there are many people who are saying in this country, Lord Hume, that in view of the extreme bitterness of the exchanges since the collapse of the summit, that no practical negotiations with the Soviet Union will be possible for several years. Do you take this view or no? Well, I think we ought to try, certainly, to get down to the discussion of the, uh, the problems which divide us well before that. Of course, it very largely depends on, uh, on Mr. Khrushchev. But um, uh, certainly, we ought, for instance, to discuss a problem like Berlin, which is getting very dangerous. And we ought certainly to try and get on with the conference on nuclear tests. Very little divides us there, you know, and we ought to be able to settle that matter. Mr. Oakes. Uh, Lord Hume, uh, on this question of disarmament, what do you think of the argument that is sometimes made that political matters, political issues have to be settled before we can really achieve any r real progress in disarmament? Well, I think um, that it's true that um, unless we get confident in each other, really the point I made just now in answering Mr. Child, unless we can find some way of getting confidence in each other, that we can't make much progress. Now, I've looked very carefully at the principles which we have each enunciated which should govern disarmament. There's very, very little between, between us. But I don't think it's much use going on making speeches about principles. Therefore, the Prime Minister Macmillan yesterday suggested that we should get down to practical business and that that was the way to create the confidence and get the political confidence of which you're talking. You have some hope that this actually can be achieved? Well, it... Realistically? Well, uh, I think it's certainly realistic that whether we shall be able to overcome uh, the Russians' historic dislike of um, anyone looking into their affairs inside Russian territory, I can't yet say. You know, they have said uh, that an overall inspection scheme seemed to them very like espionage. Now, if we could take, let us say, one aspect of disarmament, let us say fissile material, transferring that from the making of weapons to, um, uh, to peaceful uses under the United Nations, 
Now, we ought to be able to work out a system of inspection for that, which would prove to the Russians that there was no thought of espionage, but our only purpose was to begin the process of disarmament and to create confidence between us. While we're on the subject of disarmament, uh, could I ask you what you think of the uh, proposals that have been made unofficially uh, for the nuclear uh, armament of uh, Germany, of Western Germany? Well, of course, um, when you say unofficially, that's right, because yeah. there's been no uh, proposal to rearm Germany with, uh, with nuclear weapons. And if that ever did happen, of course, it would be within the NATO um, alliance. And of course, the, uh, one of the accusations of Mr. Khrushchev is that you were rearming Germany. Well, the, all the German armament, of course, is within the framework of NATO, and that should be a safeguard against Germany rearming on her own. You wouldn't take a position of pro or con the uh, possible nuclear, uh, furnishing Germany with nuclear weapons, though? Well, I think with... it's um, uh, a matter, really, for the NATO command as to where uh, nuclear weapons should be placed in the NATO structure. But um, uh, the, um, there's no question of giving Germany as a country nuclear weapons because all German arms are integrated in the NATO system. Mr. Pry, may we turn for a moment to an exploration of Mr. Khrushchev's motives? To what extent, if any, do you think that his performance at the summit in Paris, his behavior since the Bucharest Party Congress, and now his performance at the United Nations, is motivated by a struggle going on between him and Mao Zedong, between Russia and Red China? Well, there's a great um, theological argument, obviously, going on between the Russians and the Chinese. Um, I can't interpret it, but I can quite see that if uh, Mr. Khrushchev is um, trying to dilute the um, original Marxist doctrine, that is to say, if he feels that there need not be a war between the communist and capitalist system, and indeed does not want to see a war, that the, the Chinese attitude at present may be proving very inconvenient for Mr. Khrushchev, uh, and that certainly there is a division of opinion between him and the Chinese on that matter. Well, do you feel that it's a real division, uh, a division that goes deep, or is it perhaps a, a calculated gesture in which one party, one partner, works one side of the street and the other, with his full knowledge, works the other side of the street? Well, I find it also difficult to answer that. But, uh, of course, there are definite signs that uh, communist China is expanding in Southeast Asia. Um, India, for instance, relied on the five principles of coexistence, but that hasn't prevented China in, uh, making an incursion into Indian territory. And so it may well be that Mr. Khrushchev has his eye on China, but I can't say because I can't really interpret his motives. Well, from our point of view, Britain has been perhaps the most eager advocate of an agreement with Khrushchev over some period of time. Has anything that has happened modified your view as to the desirability of a detente? Uh, are the terms that are now available or likely to be available in the foreseeable future such that it would make a detente in the Western national interest? Well, I think it must be in the, in the interest of everybody that there should be a detente. Of course, we must um, stand up for our principles uh, of living and uh, as long as, um, that, that, um, as long as communist practice follows the uh, dogma laid down by Lenin and Stalin, and that is communism is expanding, then communism must be contained militarily. But you know, um, a nuclear arms race uh, gathers a sort of momentum of its own. There is a real danger of war by accident. And therefore I would have thought that it was in the common interest of everybody to try and find common ground on which we could meet Russia and the first and in spite of all the appearances, the most likely ground on which we could meet is, I think, the military ground. For the reason that I gave earlier, I think in answering the earlier question, uh, that um, it is there that I think it may be in Russia's interest uh, to disarm. Mr. Harsh. Uh, Lord Hume. 
We had a summit conference with the Russians once in Geneva in 1955. After that summit conference, there was a some evidence that the effect of summitry was to cause more relaxation on our side than on the Russian side, that they took advantage of it. Your government has continued to seek summits. Uh, may I suggest that the uh, Mr. McMill uh, Prime Minister McMillan's session with Mr. Khrushchev the other day was in, in part of partaking of the nature of a summit conference, that is, of a meeting between heads of state, which does seem, judging from the existing record, uh, to leave us weaker than it does them. May I ask you, and this is, I know, slightly repetitious of what Mr. Fry did, but would you go on and explain why, if you do, you think that it is not to our disadvantage to continue seeking meetings with the Russians at the high level? Well, because I think that you've um, got to settle your difficulties and differences, not by force, but by negotiation. Now, I've often myself thought that uh, negotiation is better carried on perhaps at a diplomatic level or even the level of foreign secretaries. But when you're dealing with heads of state and, uh, and uh, people like Mr. Khrushchev uh, in a communist state, I think there are times when summit meetings are useful. And, and Paris could have been such a one. Now, obviously, I think there's not much purpose in another summit meeting on the Paris uh, model, unless we're pretty certain that the results are going to come out of it. And so there would have to be very careful preparation. I think that is the way I would answer your but question. But isn't there always time. that danger that following a summit meeting, we will grow more weak than they will, that they can control their people, they can prevent a sort of degeneration of power, whereas we tend to go that way? Well, I wouldn't, thought, I wouldn't have thought that there had been any degeneration following the failure of the, of the summit meeting. There was great, um, uh, I think there was a great shock throughout the world that um, uh, the obvious advantages that would have followed a successful summit, summit were not available. But I would have thought that we ought to start again. But that follows the failure, not the, not the success or apparent success. Yes, I know, but all I, uh, what I'm saying is that I don't myself see evidence that we've relaxed in any way. And indeed, I just said, I think now, in answer to uh, Mr. Fry, that we cannot relax, because as long as communism is aggressive, then we must have our alliances, and it must be militarily contained. And I don't myself see any relaxation following, um, Par uh, following the Paris failure, uh, nor would I admit, I think, um, that it is likely to follow uh, any, any other uh, summit failure, although I wouldn't go into another summit myself, I think, without very careful preparation. Mr. Child. Lord Hume, as the Prime Minister pointed out in his speech of this week, the, uh, a number of Britain's former colonies have gained their independence, and you, as Minister for the Commonwealth, had a lot to do with that. I wonder if you could say, as an expert in this field, what went wrong in the Congo and whether you think there can ever be a stable government established there. Well, what um, went wrong in the Congo, uh, I think, of course, the immediate thing that caused the immediate crisis was the mutiny of the force publique. But why did that happen? Well, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you why it happened, except that I think that there was not the administrative structure or the political structure ready, really, to bear the load that was put on it at the moment when, they, when the Belgians left. Now, our purpose in our colonies, if I may say so, and I've seen a good deal of this in the last five years, has been not to give independence to a colonial territory until that um, territory was able to guarantee law and order within its boundaries and to pursue the policy of the good neighbor without. In other words, you think the Belgians had not prepared the Congo for independence? Well, it's very difficult for me to, uh, to criticize the Belgians. I'd rather uh, say that what our purpose has been in our own, in our own um, uh, colonial territories. But it, I think looking at the, Bel at, the, at the situation in the Congo now, it is really perfectly clear that there is not uh, the, the, uh, an administrative or political structure uh, and there are not enough Africans, really, to bear the load of a modern state. 
Some of these newly independent states seem to be leaning toward the communist system or the communist bloc. Would you say that President Nkrumah is leaning toward the communist bloc, President Nkrumah of Ghana? No, I, uh, I'm quite certain that uh, President Nkrumah uh, of Ghana does not want to see uh, the communists in Africa. What these African countries want to do is really to manage their own affairs. And therefore, he does not want the communists in any more than he wants the other great powers in at the present time. Uh, he may have uh, uh, certain views about the internal situation in the Congo, which, make, uh, which, uh, which he expresses slightly different from ours. But I'm quite certain on the main issue of communism that they, he does not want the communists in, in Ghana. Lord Hume, in your judgment, does the white man have any future in Africa any longer? Yes. Uh, without doubt. Um, but um, we must be given the time to work out a true racial partnership. Now, the part of Africa, as I know well, uh, are the Rhodesias. And there, there are the conditions for a racial partnership if we're given time to work it, to work it out. Mr. Oakes. Uh, Lord Hume, uh, following up this discussion of uh, Africa, I would like to uh, broaden it a bit and just ask you your opinion of the tendency toward neutralism on the African, uh, of the African states. Uh, do you uh, conceive of this general tendency as an uh, opportunity for uh, communist penetration, or rather as a means of strengthening these various countries and their own independence? Well, I think I know why they are neutralist in outlook, uh, and that is that they feel uh, absolutely rightly that their problems are not political, but economic. Yes. Uh, what they want is food, education, and the tools of the 20th century in, with which to build their countries. And you, excuse me, uh, yes. you're, you're not worried about uh, neutralism uh, o opening a door? Uh, to well, of course, uh, uh, of course it can. Of course it can. Uh, but I think the uh, African countries are very well alive to the dangers of the allowing themselves to adopt one ideology or the other at this time. And certainly we don't want to press them into our system. But in time, of course, uh, they will begin to think more of politics and their international contacts. Uh, let me broaden it to the general question of neutralism. Do you feel, uh, how do you feel about the growth of a neutral bloc in the United Nations, which we see apparent? Well, I feel that it's surely the, the essence of, of democratic thinking, and indeed the, our whole philosophy in the free world, uh, that we should allow countries to be, uh, to adopt any system they like. Uh, they can turn communist if they like, or they can be neutral if they like. But when you say a neutralist bloc, I think it's a little misleading, you know, because there are quite a number of neutral countries in Europe. Yes, uh, but it, uh, you do not see a neutralist bloc as a bloc forming in the, in the UN. Well, it could do, but as a bloc, uh, I, I'm not so sure. What I am sure about is this, that um, it would be a very great mistake if in the, in the structure of the United Nations itself we were to import uh, and in any way regularize this system of blocks because they're not constant. Well, as neutral states, do you, uh, individual neutral states, without considering them as a bloc, do you feel that they are rendering a service or a disservice to the cause of world peace and order? I don't know that you can generalize, but I think if a country is generally, genuinely neutral, uh, I can't see why it should prejudice uh, the, um, uh, the purposes which we all have in mind, uh, which is really working towards one cooperative Word, uh, world. Mr. Fry. Lord Hume, the, there are, are many people who feel that the answer to many of these questions that you've been raising is a stronger and more effective United Nations. Now, a good deal of lip service, of course, is paid to this goal. But on uh, a week or two ago, President Eisenhower proposed or renewed the proposal that the United Nations be given arrangements for a standby peace force. I noticed that Mr. McMillan failed to mention this subject. Has Britain blown cold on the point? No. We've always um, felt, and indeed Mr. Selwyn Lloyd uh, said so last year, that it would be a very good thing if nations kept forces available 
for such situations as the Congo if they were required by the United Nations organization. Well, may I turn the question around a bit and put it this way? In order for the UN to have a free hand in places such as the Congo, it's necessary to bar the intervention of the great powers. Now, the United States said quite flatly that if the Soviet Union sought to send its, quote, volunteers, unquote, to the, to the Congo, the United States would do whatever may be necessary to prevent that happening. And this, of course, would presumably include the shooting down of the Russian transport planes. Uh, is Britain also prepared to take such vigorous action to keep Russian troops out of the Congo? I'm uh, not sure what um, action the United States spokesman was, was talking of. But what we have got to do is to make absolutely certain that this situation doesn't arise. I think I said in a speech the other day here in the United States that um, I'm quite certain that we were very near a Korean situation. Now that could happen again if the great powers became involved and it is absolutely essential and we're throwing our whole weight behind the United Nations solution of the Congo problem. How much truth is there, if any, in the charge that the United States and Britain and Belgium were uh, behind or engineered the overthrow of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo? The overthrow of Lumumba's government? Yes. Oh, no. Colonel Mobutu. I uh, certainly no truth in that at all. We have played to the rules, you know. The people who haven't played to the rules of the Soviets. Mr. Harsh. Uh, Lord Hume, you said that uh, you think that uh, Mr. Nkrumah of Ghana has no desire at all to see Russians or communists, communism in Africa. But if my facts are correct, and please check me on this, when the Russian plane started flying into the Congo at the beginning of, in, in mid-July, most of the so-called passengers in those planes, I believe, bore passports visaed by the Ghanese embassy in Moscow. In other words, uh, Mr. Nkrumah's government was extremely helpful to the Russians in getting their passengers and technicians into the Congo. If he's so anxious to keep them out of Africa, why did he do that? Well, of course, um, uh, the uh, we, le we lent transport to the Ghana government, and so did the Americans lend transport to the Ghana government uh, to, uh, to take troops into, into the Congo. Uh, but um, as far as the visas are concerned, I suppose that, uh, I can't answer for Ghana. But um, but I imagine that the Ghanaian government may have thought, and may well have thought, that these planes contained help which was going to be given through the United Nations in the Congo. I can't, I think, answer a question for Dr. Nkrumah because I simply don't know the answer. But I think he certainly uh, cooperated with us and the Americans uh, in. Um, fulfilling the United Nations needs in the Congo at that time. You don't think that he deliberately and consciously tried to help the Russians move into the Congo? Uh, I'm sh quite sure that Dr. Nkrumah uh, and Ghana do not want communism in Africa, and I don't see why he should help them to establish themselves there. Gentlemen, we have only three minutes left. Make your question short. Mr. Uh, Child. You've heard, Lord Hume, a great many complaints from delegates about the United Nations in New York. Do you think we should move the United Nations somewhere else? I notice that people like coming to New York very much. I think there's quite an opposition to it. Well, a lot of them are complaining. They think that this is, uh, they're treated very rudely and in a very hostile way here. Have you noticed that yourself? I haven't noticed it at all. The next time I come here, I might turn myself into to a totalitarian because you get about the streets a bit better but otherwise <laughs> <laughs> I haven't uh, I've been treated with every hospitality and courtesy. Mr. Oh, uh, I have two very short <laughs> questions. One is sir uh, your opinion of the possible probable election of the uh, UAR to the Security Council to the seat on the Security Council in view of uh, the UAR's record uh, in respect to the canal. And well, uh, I, I think the, the, the canal incident in Suez is in the, in the past, uh, and therefore um, uh, that uh, the membership of the Security Council, uh, we would support uh, any country which we thought would genuinely contribute to the problems of the United Nations. But it's at war, is it not, uh, with uh, uh, one of its neighboring states? Well, the UAR uh, says that it's at war with Israel, I believe. Well, uh, that is, a, I don't know that that's a question I can answer now, uh, answer now, nor do we ever say who we're going to support in advance, of course, for the Security Council. I would only make the point that I, uh, uh, we hope to get on better relations with the UAR and the two is past. 
Yeah. Mr. Harsh, Lord Hume, would you like to see the President and Mr. Khrushchev meet together before Mr. Khrushchev leaves the United States on this trip? Well, that's for the, um, for the President or Mr. Khrushchev. We'd better give the first answer to that question. Uh, as you know, and I said uh, earlier, we have thought that in certain circumstances that there's a value in the meeting of uh, a meeting of heads of government. But whether those circumstances are right, uh, right now, well, that would be really for the President or Mr. Khrushchev to say in the first place. Mr. Fry. Uh, I know our time is short. Can you uh, perhaps in a word or two tell us whether you approve of the general line of United States policy toward Cuba? If not, what would you suggest as an alternative? That's a United States uh, question to which I, I couldn't give an answer now. I think it has um, all sorts of implications in which I can't get involved at any rate in a quarter of a minute. Mr. Oakes? Any hope of uh, the UK joining the common market? And what, if there is hope, can the, we do about it? Well, you know, the political will in Europe is better now, I think, for, uh, for the United Kingdom getting closer to Europe economically and politically. And therefore, I hope the United States will back us up. Gentlemen, our time is up. Monitors thanks to the Earl of Hume, British Foreign Minister, and the members of the panel, Marquis Charles of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Joseph Harsh of NBC News, William R. Fry, the Christian Science Monitor, and John Oakes of the New York Times. The most interesting and informative half hour. Meet the Press, produced by Lawrence Spivak.